Carl Brewster, a leader here with God Word Ministries, where our pastors are George and Shelly Ann Watson. Here at God Word Ministries, our mission statement is as follows. Choosing God over the devil at all times, going God's way as a church and our way of life. And our God Word vision statement is, it is to inspire people to go God Word for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is Testimony Tuesday. Well, tonight we're starting a new schedule where we will be coming to you every second Tuesday of the month on all of our God Word platforms, on our God Word Facebook page, on our God Word YouTube channel. So follow us every second Tuesday of the month. Um, tonight I come before you and I'm going to be leading it off. Uh, the last time I talked with you, and thank you so much for those of you who have joined us over the past three or four weeks. Um, it's been amazing. It's been some powerful testimonies. Onisha Edens, Pastor Al. Um, even when I did my first testimony, I, I spoke and I said, you know, I still got a lot to say. And I've talked about the major, some big things that God has done in my life through, you know, giving me the peace to my mother's transition, giving me the strength right now while my son is um, in the hospital uh, healing. So, but there's, a, there's, there's little things that God does for us throughout um, throughout the daily basis. Every day he does little things for us. And I want to talk about the little things that, that really that mean so much, to be honest with you. Um, I haven't told you guys back uh, initially when I started out that 2002, you know, I went up to manpower. I, I was chasing. I was going up there. I was chasing God. And I was wanting to be in the presence of men who were seeking God. Um, I was battling you know, my addiction, and I was just like, God, I need your help, I need your help. And so I knew T.D. Jakes was having manpower in Charlotte. Um, he's done, he does manpower, he does woman dial art loose, and then he also did Megafest. So I was like, if I could just get close to him, it's almost like if I could just touch the him in his garment. Basically, I was chasing the word. So if I could just get to this word, the Lord will have a word for me. Now also in 2002, uh, many may know, some, some of you may not know, but in 2002, I was becoming a grandfather. Now, I was gonna be a grandfather at 39 years old. I wasn't even 40. My granddaughter now is, our youngest is 19 years old. She's, she's the best thing that ever happened to us. But if you could picture that, here I am battling an addiction, trying, I didn't even know if I was being a good father. And then my daughter, you know, she came up and she was pregnant. And at first it, I took it like, you know, I was a failure, you know, I failed her, I failed her, but it wasn't that. It was just the way God has things to work. But us as a family, Brewsters, we pull together. It doesn't matter what's going on. So here I am. I got twin daughters. She's a senior in high school, and she's going to have a baby. Uh, I was losing my mind. I ain't even going to lie. I was losing my mind. So, you know, I went to my mother, God rest her soul, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, whatever. My mother said to me, she said, look, she ain't the first, and she ain't going to be the last. And she said, this ain't about you. It's about that child and God has given you all a child. And when she said that to me, I just straightened up. So I was like, okay, I got to figure this thing out. I've got to get me together. So that's why it was so imperative that I get to manpower, that I try to get this word and that God helped me with what I need. Because I was like, Lord, I need your help. I don't know how to be a grandfather. I don't even know what that is. But you know, and I said grandfather, but I, she was born in October of 2002. This was August of 2002 when I was going to manpower. So, you know, I had already said, I ain't no grandfather, I'm a granddaddy, because I'm too cool to be a granddaddy, you know? So I gave myself my own name. But, so I loaded up my, and I said before, I had this 300ZX. It was a white 300ZX, chrome rims, T-tops. I bought it for my brother-in-law. And I have to mention this car, because the reason why my brother, not the reason why, well, he sold it to me at a, at a very reasonable rate. It's kind of, you know, very reasonable rate. but. The reason why he sold it to me because the 300ZX had a linkage issue. It was like, you know, it was a five speed and when you get over to the fifth gear, you know, fifth gear is over here and reverse is down here. Well, you couldn't go in reverse. There was a linkage between, there was something stuck between reverse and fifth. Well, when I would tell people I didn't have reverse and they was like, how are you driving a car with no reverse? I ain't going backwards. I'm not driving backwards. I ain't going backwards. And I didn't even have a rear view mirror. How do you drive a car with no rear view? I'm not going backwards. And I say this because it's funny because literally in my life, I was like, I am not going backwards. I have to go forward at all times. Now, 300ZX, it was dope, it was beautiful, white. I'm telling you, it was a bad car. Um, 
But you know, I could learn how to parallel park it. You know, I just had to be on a little heel. I would pull up and roll back into the, put it in neutral, just roll back into the spot. And, and being that it was a 300ZX, it was small. You know, sometimes when I got in sticky situations, I just had to get out, put my back up against that door and push it. You know, push it backwards till I could get out. And I didn't have no shame, I didn't care. I was going forward. So anyway, I drive my 300 to, to Charlotte to go to Manpower. Now, if you've ever been to a T.D. Jakes event, Magla Fest, Woman There Out of Luth, they are, the, the, the way they handle things impeccable, the, everything is on point from when you drive up to your parking, to your registration. I mean, it's, it's done in excellence. It's done with kingdom. He does things under, in a kingdom mentality. So I drive up there, and, and there's a reason why I'm telling you guys all this. So I drive up there, and I pull into the parking lot, and of course they had a guy, you know, guys, road guard vest, telling you exactly where you park. You don't park anywhere other than where they tell you. One car pulls up, the next car pulls behind it. Well, as it would, as God would have it, I had to pull behind a vehicle that was right in front of me. So <laughs> in order for me to leave that night, I had to wait till that vehicle left so that I could pull forward or I would be pushing backwards in my 300. And, and you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't plan on doing that. I didn't want to do that. So I had been to the, I was at the, the uh, mega, I mean, at the manpower, and it was amazing. That's what I figured out. I told you he was speaking on David, and I was like, Lord, I, I'm David. You know, I'm like David. I love, I'm after God. I'm chasing God like David was. I'm after God's own heart. But at the same time, I was feeling very alone because here I am battling an addiction in Greenville, South Carolina. And the friends that I had, or the people that were around me, I had some great friends, but you couldn't tell everybody what you was going through. And then also, I was the only friend that I know that was gonna be a grandfather at 39 years old. So I didn't have nobody to reach and talk to about this other than my family, my mother, and God. So here I am, I had a lot that I was going after. I wanted to speak to God about, God, I need your answer, I need you to help me. He needs to show me how to be a grandfather, help me be a better man, help get rid of this addiction, you know, just all these things I was chasing. And you know, you go and you ask for it, you receive it. So I get there. And after the uh, event was over, we come out, I'm on a natural high. Now, if you're walking around the corridors, there's T-shirts, v- at the time it was VHS tapes, there was VHS tapes, there was everything that would empower you, books, everything, everything that would empower you after you left there. Of course, it's an event, you know, and I'm walking around looking at all these things and I wanted everything and didn't have no money. I had $20 to get there and $20 to get back. But I was just like, wow, you know, I'll be able to get it. You can go online and get it later on, but it's nothing like getting something right there, like going to a Janet Jackson concert, buy the t-shirt, you know. So, but I, I, I was okay with that because I was filled with the word. I get out to my car, right? And the, I go out to my car, the parking lot's packed, and you know you're trying to leave a big event. There's no need of moving, you know, because you can't get out nowhere anyway. So I walk to my car, and beside me, right beside my car, there was a white van. And I didn't pay the van much any attention, you know, because it wasn't there when I first came. So, you know, it's a nice August night, you know, I'm coming back, I'm on a natural high from God. And this just shows you what God would do for you. This is the point of the story, to tell you what God would do for you. Well, he'll give you what you need when you need it. I was taking the tops out of my car and I was putting them in the trunk, you know, she prayed that she was clean. And there was this teenage boy beside me. He says, I like your car, sir. And I was like, thank you. And he was like, well, what? You know, what years I told him it was in 88, 300 ZX, blah, blah, blah. And as I was telling him about the car, you know, I was like, he liked my car. You know, I was telling him about the car. Someone said to me, Carl Brewster. And I'm like, don't nobody know me here, you know? And when I turned to my right, there was a friend of mine named Billy Cook that was standing right beside me. Now, the thing about Billy Cook is he and I met in 1985 in advance camp in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, because I went to South Carolina State, and a lot of you may not may not know, I was an officer in the military. I was a commissioned officer, but we had to go to advanced camp. You pass advanced camp, then you move on to your commissioning. But when I got to, we all go up, and South Carolina State students, ROTC students, we were the best. We were, we, we, we were the dynamic. You know, we was on point, we were taught well. So I get to my company, and nobody that I knew was in my company at the time, in my platoon. So I walked into the door, when I walked into the door, there was this guy, this black dude, his name is Billy Cook. He was standing there, me and him, you know, we introduced ourselves to each other. You could stay in the long rooms or, you know, the open hallways, there was bunk beds, bunk beds, but, you know, if that guy beside you didn't make up his bed when it comes to inspection, you're in trouble. So he and I found this room upstairs and just had two bunks in it. So we talked, we vibe, we immediately clicked. 
So we decided to have this room together. Well, Billy Cook and I, he, we call each other brothers. He's my friend and my brother. To this day, he's one of the best friends that I have. But 2002, I had not seen Billy Cook, and he was a retired lieutenant colonel. I got out in three years. I got out as a first lieutenant promotable. I had not seen this man over 17 plus years. I moved to Atlanta in 1990. He was in Desert Storm, Desert Shield. He was all these places, so we lost contact with each other. But as God would have it, right there, when I'm going to manpower, seeking the word of the Lord, seeking someone to help me speak to or be around godly men that could help me, you know, maneuver what I was going through, the man that was standing beside me, I hadn't seen, and I said 17 plus years, and it was like, we were brothers, it was like not a day had passed, and he was like, oh my God, bro, and we stood there and talked, it was amazing, you know, but he had brought up a whole band of, of teenagers, some young boys, some young some guys at his church that he brought up. So it was a beautiful thing that he had brought all of them up there to the manpower. I was there by myself. We immediately exchanged numbers. The parking lot started to move, and I was like, well, I'll be here tomorrow, he will too. But as God would have it, the next day, we wound up spending some time together, talking, catching up over all these years. And in that, I was able to be vulnerable with him. I couldn't tell anybody in Greenville about what I was going through, about my addictions, trying to battle this drug addiction. Here I am a grandfather, be a grandfather at 39. I don't even know if I was a great father. You know, it was just so much that I needed to talk to somebody. And this man, all he remembers me is from his 1985, the pure Carl Brewster, who was an officer, who was like his best friend, and we were brothers, friends and brothers. He knew none of the other stuff, not the whole 1990, 99, drug challenges or whatever, but that day, God gave me what I needed in this man to be able to just tell him everything that was going on with me. And he said to him, he said to himself, he said, one of the promises God, he's like, God will never leave you. He's gonna be right there with you, you know, you got it. So it was like, God gave me what I needed in a person that I could connect with that was non-judgmental, who was gonna help me, or at least I could talk to with no problem. You know, and it was just amazing, out of 40,000 men, 40,000 men that were there, parking lots all around the building, all around the building. I parked directly beside this man, and I hadn't seen him in over 20 years. We just lost contact because, you know, that's how it happens when you're in the military sometimes. And it was like, it was amazing. So it was like, God filled me with the friend that I needed, that he gave it back to me. And it was just a beautiful thing. It was like, I didn't think about buying no book, no manual, no t-shirt, no nothing. I had my boy, you know, we was together and he was helping me and, and, and talking to me and telling me, you know, it's going to be okay. You'll be, you'll get through it. God won't leave you. So I, it was just one of the most amazing things. And we still to this day are like the best of friends. So through that, it was just like, thank you, bro. I appreciate it. And as time went on, you know, I went to, I went to another, uh, I went to Megafest. And Megafest was like in 2006. But before 2006, I'm at work. I'm at work, I'm working at New Box, which turned into New South. And my cousin, Onisha Edens, you know, you guys met her last week. She talked um, two weeks ago. Now, she was my cousin. I had no knowledge that she was my cousin at first. And we were sitting beside each other. Now, our company was very small. And, and initially, every Friday, we had a company meeting downstairs in the basement. Well, we'll go downstairs in the basement. And this is funny. We'll go downstairs in the basement. And Onisha was like the hype man. You know, she was coming into her own. She was the hype man. She would be in there, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just hyping everybody up. Because that's the way the company was. It was hyped and they would feed us. They you know, bought lunch for everybody. That's how small the company was, but they was really doing a great thing. But me, I was still in my battling. And she's my cousin. So she hyping everybody up. And I'm looking at people and they looking at her. And I felt like everybody wasn't laughing with her. I felt like some of them were laughing at her. And I took issue with it. So I confronted her. I thought I was confronting her. So I go to her, I said, yo, cuz, look, you know, I understand, you know, what's going on. I know you're the hype man, but I take issue. I mean, everybody, when you be doing your thing, everybody ain't laughing at you. Some people laughing. Everybody not laughing with you. Some people are laughing at you. And I don't like that. You know what I'm saying? I don't like that. I'm going to say something. So she was like, well, cousin, this is what I have to say to you. And she, she brought me down real nicely, but she started me on my path. She told me, she said, look, what you need to do 
is, you know, I know what God gave me. God gave me this gift. This is my gift of laughter. This is my gift. This is what God gave me. Now, everybody's not going to receive it, but God gave it to me for me to give to people. So that's what I do. Now, see, you need not worry about what God has given me. What you need to do is figure out what God has given you. Figure out your purpose. And it was like, a light went off. I was like, you know, what is my purpose? Why am I here? You know, what am I to do? Now, I'm a grandfather. Um, you know, it was, cause you know, I started wearing the grandfather hat sideways. I'm like, you know, I'm the coolest grandfather there is, you know? And Ayana is just like, you know, she called me granddaddy Superman one time when we was, uh, she might've been like three or four. And we was Halloween, because her birthday was around. She came home on Halloween day. She was born in 29, she came home on Halloween day, so we had a little outfit for her. So it was always like a Halloween party theme around her birthday. But she called me Granddad the Superman because I had on the Superman outfit. And every time she says that, it makes me cry because it was like, this girl sees, she sees this man in me. She sees this Superman inside of me as her grandfather, you know? And that's something that God gave me, whereas, man or people or you would feel some kind of way because your daughter you know had her baby you know graduating but that's not why I need to worry about that God gave me something that made me be the superman that I am she sees this in me and and through my through my challenges and my battle whenever she would say that it just would like I'm a superman and and so I thank God for her because he gave us this child so after Anisha kind of put me together and told me, don't worry about me and my gift, worry about you and your gift, you know? So I'm like, okay. So 2006 comes around, and these are just stories about things that God has done in my life that they're small things that mean so much. Um, the book, The Secret was out, and it was, it was an audio book, and it was a big thing. So I was watching The Secret, and it was really good, and it was there were some things in The Secret that would tell you, um, you know, the man was like, I would, he would talk to his mailbox and say, checks are, checks are in the mail, checks are in the mail, because he was getting all these bills. He said, what he was basically teaching us, that whatever you put out in the atmosphere is what will come back to you. And that was their way of teaching it, but what I find it to be faith, you know? So it was their way of teaching it, but it's also faith. So I started doing what he was saying, you know? It was like, I'm big on favor. I call favor to everything, you know? I call favor like, he even said, like, if you go to the mall and you find a parking spot that's close to the door when you just get in there, you call it favor. If you call things as they were, they will continue to come to you. What you put in the atmosphere comes back to you. So, I, dude, ain't a time, I mean, ain't a time I go to a mall or anywhere, I'd be like, favor, 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 favor. If I'm driving, if I'm going to a restaurant, I call favor on everything, and favor always comes forth. It's true, it's real. Now, I tried the checks in the mail, you know, the checks in the mail, checks in the mail, checks in the mail. And I kept saying that, and, and honestly, I was running to that mailbox looking for the checks in the mail. I, no lie, you know, you gotta believe it, you gotta speak it, and you gotta see it. So I was calling checks in the mail, checks in the mail, and I would go to the mailbox and check it. He, in his story, he was getting checks in the mail. All I was getting was those finance company letters, which, you know, $8,000, you got $50,000, the same, you know, you got to do all kind of stuff. But I didn't get a check in the mail at that time. So 2006, I'm, I'm in this secret. I love it. It was very inspirational. And um, in 2007 came, Megafest was in Atlanta. Um, again, I'm driving my 300ZX, you know, no reverse, no real mirror. Sharp as I'll get out, take the T-tops out, no air conditioning. If you ride with me, the tops are out and you're gonna get a suntan. That's just how it is. And everybody knew it. Don't get in here, your hair gonna blow, T-tops coming out. Night, day, I think I might even did it in the winter. Sometimes I just turned the heat on. But I just love ride because it was a beautiful car. So I wanted to go to Megafest. I had, again, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm granddaddy, I'm paying bills, I'm. I'm trying to make it, you know, I'm struggling, but I'm trusting God through all of this. And I want to go to Megafest. And again, I didn't have anybody around me at the time, friends wise, that I could say, yo, you wanna to go to Megafest with me? Because this was my journey. This is what I was after. This was, this was me changing me. I didn't need anyone else to help me. I just need to do it on my own. The more I did it on my own, me and God, God would, if you call, if you take one step, I'll take two. That's how I felt. So. I was going to Megafest, I had $20 to get down there and $20 to get back. 
So I drive down to Atlanta. I couldn't even get off from work early. So I think I worked through my lunch and I might have left at four. And um, drove real rough, got down there, drove down to Atlanta. I couldn't even park in a parking garage because I didn't have no parking garage money. So I'm driving around the Georgia Dome saying, favor, 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 Lord, I need a parking space. Lord, favor, just give me favor. I roll up on a parking space as God would have it. it Georgia Dome was right there. There was a parking space. A car had just pulled out. So I pulled up, but it wasn't on a hill. I pulled up beside the car, and I, look, I need this parking space. I got out of my car, put it in neutral, turned that wheel like I do, put my back up against it, and backed it up into that spot, and whipped it up in there, so I got my free parking space. Now, that parking space did a lot for me. I mean, one, it was favor, and I was very, very happy. So I ran into the, I was running a little late, I ran into there, and right here, I even have, I'm a big note taker. I still have the notes from that mega fest. It was 72106, and at the top of it, it says, arrived just in time for the word. Thank you, God. Because I was seeking a word. I was like, Lord, I just need a word. I just need a word from you to help me, to help me. So he was preaching about, during this time, he was preaching about uh, Exodus 2, 8 through 14, with an emphasis on um, verse 10, and it was called, draw it out of me. You know, and it was about Moses when they drew him out of the water. So I'm just gonna read the beginning of this. It says, rejection is a part of direction. And if it was good for me, I wouldn't have gotten it. And God has a plan in my life. Moses means to be drawn out. You need to be around people who are raising you or me up. It has a lot to do with my destiny. So I was seeking my destiny, you know. So I go in there, the, the sermon was amazing. The people, it was packed in, in the Georgia Dome. And then at the end, you know, to get to the point where um, they're taking up tithes and offering. Well, you know, it's Mr. Jake's. I think they might have started out with everybody who has a thousand or two thousand. I don't know the number. It could have been twenty thousand. All I know is when I got to Atlanta, I went and put the fifteen dollars worth of gas in my car to make sure I had gas to get out of here because I know me, I'll be no messing around and ate something, and then I wouldn't be able to get back home. So I put the gas in the car, parked the car, and I had five dollars left. I get in there, they doing their ties and nothing. If you got two thousand dollars, three thousand, bring it down. Our people was bringing money like crazy, but I ain't had a cut of money. You know, I just didn't. And I'm a red, at the time I was a Red Bull guy, I was a Red Bull junkie. And I was holding on to my $5 because I needed a Red Bull to drive back to Greenville. I just needed one Red Bull, I already had gas in my car, and I'm driving back to Greenville. He kept going and he kept me bringing the number down and down. If you've been to any event or any church service, you know how, how it's done. And it's okay, you're supposed to give to the Word. You know, you, you sow into the Word, it's sowing. I didn't know what sowing was. I, I was learning what sewing was. I was giving, but I was learning what sewing was. So it got down to the point where he said, whatever it is that you have, give. And I was thinking to myself, I need my little $5. I need this Red Bull. I need this Red Bull to drive back. But it was like, it was tugging on me. Whatever you have to give, give to God for this word. So I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I went down with my little $5 ball up in my hand so nobody could see and went down there, dropped my $5 in and felt good that I had sown into this word, draw it out of me. Because I was asking God, draw it out of me, Lord. Draw what you want from me out of me. Draw the good as well as the bad, draw it out of me, you know? And that's why I still have this word to this day. So the event was over, I'm walking back to my car. I get back to my car, there happened to be a minivan parked behind me with a Tennessee plate on it, I believe. And the hood was up. So I was walking on mind my business, getting ready to get in my car. And the gentleman says, excuse me, sir, we, uh, we left our lights on in the car. Um, do you happen to have any cables? And I was like, you know, this was an old car. Yeah, I had some heavy duty cables, but I wasn't perfect. I didn't know how to use them that well. You know, I got the cables, you know how to use them, we're good. And so he was like, um, um, yes, I know how to use them. So I was like, well, I'm gonna have to turn my car around, you know, so that we could do this. And the car in front of me had already moved, so I was able to turn my car around. I hooked up that car, it was a, it was a, it was a family. It was a man, his wife, and a couple of kids, and they had came down from Tennessee or whatever. And 
I jumped their car off, and as I jumped the car off, he was just so thankful, so grateful, and I was like, you're welcome, you're welcome. So I was putting the cables back in my car, and I went around, because you know, I was like, it just feels good to help somebody. I like to help people. So I, when I walked back around to my car, the man gave me $20. And I was like, huh? And I was like, no, 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 you don't have to give me no. He said, no, 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 this is, you know, this is for you. You know, you helped us, you helped us a lot. And I was like, well, thank you. but." You just don't know what went on in my head and in my mind. Because I was obedient and gave my little crumpled up $5, you know, for, for go that red bull, the obedience in it, God multiplied my $5 times four inside of 20 minutes. It was like, it was amazing. And I was like, you know what, God, and this is one of those things where I'm like, through life, God will show you small things. He will show you little things. It's not always the big things. The big things are great. Don't get me wrong, but those little things are the ones that continue to, to build you up, to keep you going, keep you moving forward. So I was so happy about my $20. And yes, I did get a Red Bull. I got me a Red Bull and got on back. I think I even stopped at McDonald's or something. I was eating McDonald's then. But, um, you know, there's times when, you know, these little things happen and it was, and it was so good for me. And I was, I was very happy because God just kept showing himself to me. Because again, I didn't have anybody to really talk to, but I was just chasing him. I was chasing God. So um, around 2008, I believe it was, I um, was going to New York. And you know, I'm getting stronger in the word. I'm getting stronger in who I am, pruning people. I'm separating myself from things. But I had great friends in New York and I love New York. New York is just major to me. So I went up to New York with a friend, a female friend of mine. She was from Jersey. We flew up to New York. We stayed at one of my homeboys. Um, but while we were there, I had a breakdown. I had a mental breakdown. Some, I'll save you the details, but it was a lot going on. And it was, it felt like there were forces pulling good and evil with me. And it was a Friday night. I never forget. We was at Uptown Manhattan, a kind of a nice little swanky place, you know, happy hour. And in the midst of it, I was sitting there and I started feeling this thing coming down on me, like coming down pretty hard. So I asked somebody for a cigarette and they was like, Carl, you don't smoke. I was like, I just want to separate myself. I need to go outside. So I went outside to smoke the cigarette. And one of my homeboys called and I was like, he said, what's going on? I said, man, I don't know. Something happened to me. I don't know. I'm about to lose it. And he was like, yo, I'll be there. So he came and he was like, what's wrong with you, bro? By the time he arrived, I had started crying. <laughs> I cried from 5 p.m. that evening to I know one in the morning. We had every place we went, they was like, what is wrong with him? They was like, what's wrong with him? But I was having a breakdown because it was, there was forces pulling me. So I get back, I cried all night. I mean, I really did. I just could not stop crying. I couldn't understand it. I kept my shades on. I kept trying to cover it up. And they was like, what's wrong with him? But we goes into this Jamaican restaurant. And uh, I let them go in first because I was trying to pull it together. I swear to God, I was trying to pull it together. I just couldn't. I walk into the restaurant and one of the Jamaicans was like, what's wrong with your baby? And I was like, I don't know. And I just started crying. And we was like, I don't know who was in Harlem, wherever we were. But she just came and hugged on me. And she's like, it's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. And I just kept crying. And even riding the train back, we rode the train back from Manhattan to Jersey. And it was just me and a female friend of mine and she was like you gotta pull it together you can't get on this train crying and i was like look i get on this train crying i dare uh, mickey fricky to mess with me because i got the whole spirit of god i would tear this train apart so we get off the train we get to the house we're supposed to walk these blocks through these neighborhoods and if you ever been in new york there's a couple of blocks that could be good bad and then you get to another couple that'd be good but we get to the house and i and i tell the story to say this she said this to me she was like you know I don't know what your problem is. She's like, you know what? You got this God complex. You want everybody to get along. You want everything to go right. You just want so much. You just got this God complex. Me, I took it almost like I was taking it as that's a compliment, but the way she was saying it, it wasn't coming as no compliment. So I had, you know, we had a conversation. I was like, well, what's the opposite of a God complex? The devil. So. Yeah, I do, I am. But that's when I was starting to come into my own and understand who I am. It's like, that's what I want for people. I want peace, I want, God can do all things. He can change everybody. He can change everything and everybody. But you know, me and her had to have a few words. Now, to this day, she and I are still the best of friends. She's saved, she loves God. She sends me, she sent me a card not too long ago about how she thanks me for always being there with her and helping her to see it. But at the time, she didn't understand it. She was just like, this God complex. Me. 
God complex is a is a beautiful thing. So we come back, we go on, things are fine. So I'm learning who I am. So my cousin, again in 2015, I'm still trying to figure out my purpose and walking in my purpose. So I started, you know, just trying to understand and studying the Lord, show me my purpose. I, Cause I would hate to live a whole life and not know what my purpose is. We all do. You know, your testimony is, you wanna know who you are and how you can help someone else. So my cousin, and, and this is kind of gonna get to the end. She has sent me an email one time. And I'm gonna read this quick email and it says, it was August 5th, 2015. She said, cousin, you have expressed a place in my life and a huge part of my heart. You allow me to see things in a different way through your eyes. I have learned and still learning from you and I thank you. You're the spirit that makes connections from all walks of life. You give others the heart to keep going just by being who you are. And that is Carl Brewster and that is Carl with the K. Cause I tell everybody it's Carl with the K and the K stands for kingdom. Um, I don't take it, I don't take our time for granted. I embrace the moments and I be ready for the new moments. My life has been forever blessed because you're my cousin. Only you can turn the story around and make me also be like, did he check me? You know, because she checks me, I check her. You know, you gotta have people that keep you together. And it's not, we're not checking each other, we just hold each other accountable. Um, we, we all have a side, some just hide theirs, and we choose to live our life out loud without shame, guilt, or despair. We are who we are, we are who we are, and we take it or leave it, but you will respect the gift. And that's it, I live on respect. You know, it doesn't matter if people like people or not. You gotta respect people, you gotta respect people where they are. Love people where they are and respect them. Respect is key in my life. Respect the gift that God has given us. Carl, your purpose in life is connection. You have connected so many that become friends, lovers, and even enemies, but you're the connection that starts the healing that is needed. You connect your spirit. She's just talking about connecting my spirit with a woman who has millions, and yet you still with the connection to the point even her puppy connected with you. So I don't mean to write so much, but you have been in my journal for a while and the word connection is there and I have been praying for weeks on your behalf about your purpose, connection. Read the word connection, think about Daniel in the lion's den and the connection he needed to have with God so that he could tame the lion and walk out without a scar. So I say that to say, you gotta have people in your life who understand and, and walk with you and go with you and show you who you are. You know, connection. Um, I do connect with people easily. I always have, and, and I, I've always thanked her for it. You know, the power of connection. Um, but right now, you know, with God, I mean, it's the little things that we just have to continue to trust Him and rely on Him and live for Him. He'll drop little. I could go on and on about that. Somebody paid my light bill one time. I don't even know the lights was turned. You know, I, God has done so many things for me that he continues, even with the peace with my mother, giving me the peace with my mother, the strength to handle my son, to be in this situation with our son right now, giving the strength to my whole family. Um, the thing about it is, you know, when you have friends, uh, Apostle Pack said this last night, you need to be visible. Um, you said visible, vocal, and vulnerable. People just need people to show up. If you're gonna be with somebody or be for somebody or be in a ministry or whatever, just be visible, you know, show up. Be vocal while you're there. Don't just sit there and not say anything. Be a part of and be vulnerable. That's what this testimonies are about, for people to be vulnerable so that people can understand this is God, this is all God. One of the promises of God is he said that I will be with you. He never said that it was gonna be easy. He never said that it was gonna be nice. He never did say that it was gonna be nice that I would cry. I mean, there's still days, you know, I have my hard time, but I put that foot on the floor and I keep going. Um, God, this past year, 2019, 2020, God had Carl Bruce in a spin cycle. I mean, like the spin cycle, and life was turning so fast. My son was in the traumatic car accident on Friday, uh, Saturday, January the 18th. On Thursday, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21th, 22th, and 3th, 24th, about Thursday, January the 24th, the company that I have been working for for the past 21 years downsized. And they decided that my department and some people in my department were going to be downsized. So they downsized me. I have family members and close friends that don't even know that I'm quote unquote unemployed. But that's God. He put me in this spin cycle and it was like, God, what next from my son to this? And 
When people lose their jobs, you know, sometimes you lose your mind. But the peace of God that he gave me, that sustains me, was just like, it was just like, okay, God, this is it. You know, this is it. I have to trust you. I have to walk with you. I have to keep moving forward with you. I know that if he puts me in a spin cycle, he's getting something from me. And I just have to continue to trust him and walk in him. And people will say, well, why didn't you tell us that you know that you weren't working? I don't want nobody worried about Carl. I want people to pray for my son. I want them to focus on my son and what God can do. Because God, my life, God, I don't have to say anything. I just have to live it out. God will show himself in my life, and he has. Um, I'm like anybody else. I got car payments, car insurance, life insurance. I got all those things, and all those things are paid because God will do it as long as we trust him. So I just wanted to bring those few things in, tell you guys the stories about rely on God, trust God. Um, don't ever not, because God, the promises of God are true. Now, with all that being said, and I know I've probably talked your ear off, um, we are asking that if there's anyone out there, if you have a, a testimony that you would like to share with us, please reach out to us on our Facebook page and or, um, yeah, reach out on our Facebook page and then we'll get with you. And then we'll get with you. We're working out how we're going to pull it together so that we can, if you're local, we can do some local interviews. We're working it all out. But if you have a testimony, we definitely want to hear from you. Um, if you're... If you're available Sunday, you know, join us um, Sunday at 10 a.m. on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Join the Godward Ministries. So I thank you guys for so much for listening to me, for allowing me to be vulnerable, just to see this walk and what God can do and will do. Big things as well as little things. So as we always say, we thank you and we love you. And there's nothing you can do about it.